Welcome to the sixth iGEM Academy video. I'm going to be talking about the famous polymerase chain reaction and the reason that it's so vital for molecular biology research. This is going to be the first of two videos and I'm going to be doing more of a concise conceptual version here. Uh, for more details on the mechanism, see part two. So let's say you're a researcher working with E. coli and there's a certain segment of its genome that you're very interested in. Uh, it could be a gene, it could be a non-coding region, whatever it is. So you ask your friend to take the genome uh, to extract it from the E. coli, and here I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger, and I'm going to make a loop of it, just kind of one section, and we're going to look at this one in more detail. So let's say, of course, all DNA is double-stranded, but I'm going to kind of emphasize that by drawing it like this. So this is, the, of course, the two strands for this one little segment. And then, of course, in this segment, we have that gene of interest or that sequence of interest, whatever it was that we were interested in. And I'm going to denote it in this blue color here. Right. So you might tell me, hey, why don't we just uh, find restriction enzyme sites kind of flanking that? So like here and here, and we'll kind of cut it out. Um, that, that could work. But the problem is the genome is very large and you're going to find that there are going to be many, many other uh, restriction enzyme sites throughout the genome. And you won't be able to, to isolate your fragment by size alone. Um, it's simply the fact that there will be too many other sequences like it. So one solution is to design primers and use PCR. So uh, let's erase those. So primers would look something like this. So maybe this primer would go here and this primer would go here. So primers are single-stranded DNA that are going to be complementary to flanking sequences around your gene of interest. And of course, these guys actually have a directionality, right? So this guy, in, in a sense, points this way. So this guy kind of points this way, and this guy kind of points this way. Uh, it's a good way to think about it. So, uh, and this side is considered 5 prime, while this side is considered 3 prime for this primer. And for this guy, this side is 5 prime, and this side is 3 prime. So to understand this, I'm going to shift up here and look at the uh, molecular structure of DNA. So here is kind of, so a nucleotide is this segment here. Uh, this is like the base, you know, A, T, C, G, that kind of thing. This is a ribose sugar, part of the uh, backbone. And then you have the, the phosphate group in green here. And I've denoted, uh, you can see here in blue, the different carbons of that ribose sugar. There are five. So there's one, two, and maybe I'll even write it down. So there's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, four, and five. So you can maybe get an inkling as to why it's it's called 3' prime and 5' prime as I've denoted here, right? The 3 carbon points kind of in this direction, so that would be the most extreme carbon on this side, right? That's the 3 one there. And then the 5 carbon is the most extreme on this side. It's the it's the closest to this side. So scientists uh, have kind of had this naming convention where, you know, this side is just kind of the direction of 3' prime and this is the direction of 5' prime. And an important note is that DNA polymerase DNA polymerase can only build off of DNA from its 3' prime end, right? So you can imagine if there was more DNA on this side kind of going this way, right? You can just imagine more and more bases on this side. Um, DNA polymerase could build off of this 3' prime end according to what the sequence is here, you know, kind of going onward, um, in order to, to construct new DNA. So that's the, the same idea that we're going to be exploring down here, right? So we've designed primers that have, um, the, you know, the three prime end here, and that's where DNA polymerase can build off of. So in essence, when you design primers that flank a certain sequence, and then you do PCR on it, so PCR, um, you're going to get a massive amplification of everything in the middle. Um, and so the, the actual PCR reaction is just a, a thermocycling, so a, a cycling of temperature. So you start off, of course, at room temperature, and then you go up all the way to 94 degrees, something like that, 94 degrees. And of course, this allows these two strands, which are actually hydrogen bonded, of course, to one another, to break apart. Those hydrogen bonds are broken at 94 degrees, and that allows the primers to kind of get in between in the places where they should be. So we kind of stay there for a little bit, and then we decrease the temperature down to something like 60 degrees. And this is a good temperature for primers to then find their place, you know, their, their complementary sequence here and here, and bind. So this gives them an opportunity to do that. We stay there for a little while longer, and then we go up to 
around 74 degrees. And this is the active temperature of the thermostable DNA polymerase, right? So most life doesn't survive at 74 degrees Celsius, but they have found in some interesting uh, species of bacteria called archaea that are um, thermophilic, so they really like hot temperatures. They have versions of DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase, TAC polymerase, um, which is able to actually do this at 74 degrees. Then TAC polymerase allows the elongation of DNA this way, right? Then we bring the temperature back up to 94, we take everything back apart, and then we repeat the cycle, right? 94, and then we repeat. And this cycle tends to be repeated something like, so here's the cycle, the cycle tends to be repeated something like 30 times, right? And so by the law of exponentiation, uh, every time that you do the cycle once, um, you're doubling the number of, of, uh, of copies of whatever was between the primers, right? So after about 30 times, you get billions of, of whatever it was that was between your primers, billions of versions, right? So here I'm just going to draw them in your little PCR reaction. Uh, so that's the result. You get a lot of it. Right? And this is great. Now we can work with this. You know, We can clone these into, into a vector. Right? So let's say we have our vector. Yeah. And then we can you know, put that sequence in. And then we can you know, do our research with it. Right? So this is, this is a plasmid. Um, and now we've got our, our PCR segment in there. So I think that's a good place to end. This is a good kind of conceptual overview of how PCR tends to be used. And for more detail about exactly how the uh, thermocycling works, Tune in for episode number two.